The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International. We are live on YouTube and Facebook with the 23rd episode of The Tuning Fork. And um, Emily Harris is here in the room right next to me. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, this is her, her hand. <laughs> there she is. Thanks, Narenda. So glad that you're, you're with us today. And, um, this is the tuning fork and, um, we have visits with cultural activists around the world. Every Tuesday since September, with a few exceptions, um, COVID is changing things in terms of uh, warm weather, people getting vaccinations, and we may be shifting our hours to another time slot and perhaps alternating um, every second week. What do you think about that, Ron? Yeah. Um, times are changing. And so the tuning fork will change. Um, Narendra, the idea is that we, we occupy this sort of time and space holding a certain topic in our, in our uh, conversation, um, enabling people who gather and who watch this either now live or afterwards to tune into uh, the sort of spirit of cultural activism that um, is quite vibrant now around the world. Um, and so in this context, we meet and um, <laughs> we have a little technical thing, people trying to call. Um, and I have a few questions for you. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have everything we need, Emily, to screen share. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to control the camera angles here in, in the studio, in the Zoom studio. So um, we maintain a kind of um, sensibility or a rigor of community, and we'll keep the community visual space uh, busy with pictures of everybody. Um, first 60 minutes were reserved to conversation with Narenda and I, lucky me. And um, then the final 30 minutes have to do with interactivity between um, participants. Um, so it's kind of like a dinner party. And um, Anyone of us here or family? And we met Narenda. I, Emily and I met Narenda at a family dinner because her daughter, by the way, is dating um, my nephew. Full disclosure. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's as much as we know right now. Um, <laughs> Narenda, it, it'd be great it, it, to understand a little bit about your background, and I'm curious. Um, how many languages are you familiar with, for example? Well, how many languages can I speak and speak well? <laughs> Not necessarily speak, maybe just hear and understand kind of familiar. Um, obviously English, uh, French, as they say in Arabic, shway shway Arabic, um, and it's pretty much it. Um, yeah, I've only listed, lived in like francophone speak. Uh, did you, did you pick up French in, in Europe or were you, did you study French? Uh, no, I lived in Switzerland when I was a kid. Um, I went to a British school, but they gave us like French um, lessons. So I was pretty fluent as a small child. And then when I came back, uh, moved to the States, there wasn't really a, a rigorous like language uh, offering at my elementary school in the 80s. So there, you know, it didn't, it didn't stick. However, I did go back to Switzerland, you know, for a couple, a couple summers and, you know, it kind of picked it up again. Yeah. yeah. But it's definitely not the same. Um, I just wonder, can everybody hear Narenda? Can you all hear I can. It? You know, I'm on my iPhone now. That, that's nice. It didn't okay. work with the pad. Yeah, it did okay. not work with the pad or with the computer, but it's okay on the phone. 
So I heard Narenda and I can see you. Thanks, Mom. Glad you're on board. Um, one of three devices works. That's that's pretty good odds. Uh. <laughs> okay. So let everyone could uh, please stay on mute for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. And um, we're recording this so everybody can, can listen to it and watch again. Um, yeah. So I, I mentioned in my email to you, Narendra, that I was curious about what it was like to live in the household um, where perhaps there was a lot of international conversation, um, topics. Uh, it's a very interesting space, I imagine, to occupy um, when one of your parents are in the um, international field. Was that the case? Can you tell us a little bit about that environment? Well, I have to like kind of maybe back up a little bit because I didn't come from a very conventional family. Um, as I told you, my mom is Liberian, my dad is Lebanese, um, but his religion, the Druze, um, they don't allow for outside uh, marriage outside of the religion. So my mother and father were not allowed to get married. Um, and my aunt and uncle ended up raising me. So my aunt and uncle on my mom's side. So the Liberian. So my uncle was in the diplomatic corps, but he worked for our uh, maritime uh, group there. So he was stationed wherever the, uh, the UN was. So we were in Geneva, we were in New York. Sorry, my throat's a little dry. Um, yeah, take, yeah. Take, take your time, you know, no rush with responses and have a quick glass of water. We'll all do that. Um, someone's waiting in the waiting room, Emily. Uh, there's Nancy and Darla. Nancy Azar is, was our guest a few weeks ago. As you know, perhaps Narenda, Nancy is one of the foremost uh, pioneers of feminism and the development of feminism as an institute, uh, you know, nurtured through classes and contact Sorry, in the community for many, many years, um, known worldwide. So thanks, Nancy, Thank for being you, here. Um, I mean, do you feel in some way, Narendra, that you had a, um, a, a perspective or a vantage point on, on the world that was um, unusual or unique? Did you feel that way growing up? I can't up? hear you, John. Oh. Can't hear me? Can't hear me? Can, can anybody hear me? Ron, my, my I, mother's you coming it through. Was issue, it, was issue, it was issues with my computer. I just put my headphones in, so that should help. Okay. So, Narenda, I was just asking because, you know, you have an unusual, um, you know, childhood, an unusual, uh, unusual experiences, perhaps, uh, other than, you know, many of us, most people maybe, um, what was that environment like at home with, with your aunt and uncle? What was the, uh, you know, with, and by the way, your name, Eid? Eid. Eid? Eid? Is it, is it Eid? Does it, it's the time of fasting. We know that. Oh, no, that's Ramadan. Eid is actually just like this, the holiday. It's like a festival or a feast. That's what it stands for. Uh, that's what it means. Um, but my last name isn't that. Like I said, my family is Druze. They're not Muslim. Um, and it I don't actually don't really know the origination of our last name, but it is similar to, to Eid, like the festival um, preceding uh, or proceeding Ramadan and, uh, and Fatir. So some people identify with their names to the sort of extent that they sort of inhabit the name in some way, you know, like your, your name is celebration. Are you <laughs> in that mode in, in your life? Do you feel that you're like, they gave you the right name or something like that? You know, like when you're, when you get a spiritual name, you have these sort of inherent obligations to maintain. Like, um, <laughs> my name, my spiritual name is, um, perfect holder of the lineage of Padma Sambhava. Whoops. It's quite, it's quite a lineage you've got to uphold. It's, yeah, it's very flowery. 
but you've been awesome. involved with working with identity and um you know identification with uh gender um race etc et how do you relate to this idea personally sociologically that you know i mean i think just being raised the way i was like i was always like like they call it a third culture kid where you're born of one culture you live in another culture and then within that those two worlds you create culture within yourself right um and not to say that i was an outsider everywhere but i was essentially i wasn't quite Liberian enough. I wasn't quite Lebanese enough. I wasn't American. I wasn't Swiss, you know, so I kind of lived on a, in a weird space, not, not one that I've ever felt like I didn't belong. Although moving to New Jersey in the eighties, I got some, um, some, a welcome that I wasn't quite prepared for, um, when I moved to New Jersey, but it, it did, I always felt like I belonged wherever I was because I just always, like if you look at my dad's side of the family, my mom's side of the family, I've just been able to occupy all the spaces, but I've also had a different perspective when occupying those spaces. Um, I was very keen on, like when I, when I was really small, my grandmother, who's, who is Muslim on my mother's side, um, would take me to the mosque with her and even at like four or five, I can remember, I remember this vividly, we went to the mosque and um, she was like, okay, we have to go this way. And we went upstairs to where the women were. And I was just like, why do we have to be up here? And why do the men have to get to be down there? Like, why, you know? So I was always really inquisitive, really trying to understand like how things worked, observing it and questioning it. Um, so when it was with regard to, I guess that was my first understanding that men and women were treated differently. Um, and then with regard to like race, obviously, you know, I'm growing up in a, in Switzerland in like a very white town in New Jersey called Park Ridge. There wasn't much, many of us. So there, and like I said, I had a very rude awakening when I moved there. Um, being called the N word, you know, and having people throw rocks at my grandmother. Um, so that really quickly told me that I was different and just observing how, you know, through family and in the, in the neighborhood and, and then television, how we view each other. So it's always something that kind of, I picked up on, you know, I was very aware of even my dad's family, like they're, you know, they're a bit racist, but <laughs> I love them. The ones that I love, I love. Um, so like just always what what makes somebody who they are is just something that's always, um, yeah, it's always been of interest to me. What makes Miranda, somebody who what, they are. What, if any, are the sort of up upsides of that being an outsider? What, um, what are the assets that that may offer immediately or perhaps later in your life that um, is it an opportunity or something? Is it a, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that may inform um, your work to some degree that I'd like to explore because you're in a very um, privileged um, sort of position mm -hmm. as an international, multi-racial, multicultural uh, human being. Uh, at this time in, in, in the history and civilization, that's a very powerful uh, position, I think, as a cultural producer. So it would be very in, informative to just um, dwell on this for a, a moment or two. What do you think? <clears throat> I mean, I think, yeah, there's, there is a privilege that comes from being able to straddle borders and lines and you know, occupy spaces that normally wouldn't be, um, that would be a barriers to entry. Um, but then, yeah, like it gives, there's a certain objectivity that comes with it where you can look at things for what they are rather than just because you've been indoctrinated into a certain, you know, dogma or, you know, national identity. 
Um, so yeah, it does. I guess it's like a gift and a curse because sometimes my friends and I would say, you know, if only we didn't know what we know, then it would, life would be so easy, you know, like um, ignorance is bliss. But when you know things and you see them and you see how unaware other people are of um, what's informing a lot of their decisions. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be, um, it can be tricky. It can be hard. Can you think of an example where, you know? Um... Well, if, you know, just to segue into like the work, um, yeah. right. the, the inspiration for the ripple effect, which is um, the ripple effect is basically an exploration of male, you know, mass masculinity and vulnerability, um, kind of reimagining what it means to be a man. Um, that was actually inspired by a conversation with a friend of mine years ago who um, babysat her nephew who was like two or three years old. Um, and when she got back, I was like, oh, how'd it go? And she, she said very offhandedly, oh, he was just, you know, he just kept crying. And I, you know, I told him to be a man. And I was just struck by that. And I was just like, if he can't cry at two years old, when is he going to be able to cry? Um, and that kind of just got my mind going about like, what masculinity really or manhood really means in our society and in different societies, you know, um, and whether or not as a woman, she was upholding, you know, these ideals of masculinity. It didn't matter. She didn't even realize what she was doing was, you know, detrimental to not only her, uh, him, but, you know, women that he will encounter as he gets older because he's unable to express himself emotionally. Um, just by virtue of being told, just by virtue of being told, be a man at two years old, you're already clamming up. You're telling him you're not allowed any emotion out other than um, rage ultimately. So that was, you know, having that objectivity, just being very like, just having a different perspective kind of gives, gave me an up, it made it an opportunity to talk about um, these, these issues. So what Around what time was that in relationship to your developing the idea of the ripple effect? Oh, um, so that probably happened maybe a couple, maybe a year or two from that that instance, and then when I realized that the scrotum does this rippling motion. And I just kind of paired the two, I think it may be about a year or two. Um, but I didn't actively start working on it for a while because it was daunting. Like who, how do you ask them, you know, men don't wanna talk about their feelings typically. Um, and then to add this twist of like having a sitting where, you know, this macro image of the most vulnerable part of your body um, is going to be shot. It doesn't, you know, you kind of got to build up to that. So I, I, it took a while to get. So, so we're talking very specifically about your filming these, the genitalia, the, the testicles of these, of the men who actually were being interviewed. No, here's the thing. Men who would, who would be interviewed and talk about how they viewed masculinity and their emotions didn't want to sit for the, um, didn't want to do the sittings and men who sat for me didn't want to be interviewed like there was a limit to how vulnerable they would allow themselves to be with me um, with the exception of one one person one or two people sorry two people um other than that nope they were it was like they could be and they could be in their body or they could be in their minds or their hearts they couldn't be in both places at once. And obviously I wasn't interviewing them while they were sitting, but you know, um, yeah, it was, it was something that was hard for a lot of people. And some people just outright told me they weren't interested. Even though they thought it was a good idea, they weren't interested in participating at all. So I, I understand like this little child who's being told not to be himself at the moment not to be human, not even not to be himself, not to be human, you know, 
just not to be human. It's so not even a- there has to be a ripple effect for that kid. Indeed. And we're also seeing the, the texture of the skin of the testes moving and rippling. Yeah. And the There's sound a muscle of- called the tunica dartos that what causes the rippling. It's called the tunica dartos. Um, it's like a thin muscle that, you know, is activated by heat, cold, uh, arousal, um, fear, and that's what causes the ripple. Or, you know, even, you know, pleasure will, will cause it to, uh, to ripple. So it's almost like, you know, looking into this whole inner world, the physiological um, neurotransmission, you know, um, emotional sensations related to emotions and all of this um, within the sort of um, context and, and breadth of a ripple effect. And, and, and then the sound of the ocean in the work. So it's um, an installation that you are experimenting with still are you, um, is it still a kind of uh, in development and, you know, do you feel comfortable um, with your own vulnerability, um, experimenting, not having a finished um, final form? What is that experience like as, as an aesthetic kind of, um, you know, uh, immersion for you? I mean, uh, I have not been able to show it in its full, uh, in- like the full incarnation of it, which is a multi-channel um, installation where I have projections, three projections of, of the scrotums and then the interviews because I don't want them together. Um, I've had to put them together um, for, a single channel, yeah. for a single channel. And I I even got I have gotten feedback because I've shown it a couple of times and people are really mesmerized by it because there's an element of, uh, you know, maybe it's a reach, but like it's a meditative quality to, to watching and viewing the, um, the ripples and then having to also like, you know, having it compete with the voiceover of the men as they talk about their emotions. Um, for some people it was really kind of distracting. Um, and, or they weren't able to pay attention at all. So it kind of loses its meaning. So ideally I'd like it to be shown as it's meant to be shown. Obviously with COVID, um, we've got to modify some things, but um, I, yeah, I think that, you know, I would like to continue interviewing men because the, the conversation is changing. From when I first like started the, pro, um, started interviewing people, you know, eight years ago to, the last batch of interviews I did two years ago, um, the conversation has changed. We're talking about gender more in our society. We're talking about fluidity. We're talking about a lot of things that back when I first interviewed guys, they hadn't even considered, you know, like questions, very basic questions I was asking them. And they're just like, I've never, I've never thought about that. I've never considered that. Like it wasn't even in their purview. So I think it would be interesting to just see how it you know, in the, through the zeitgeist, how it changes men's perceptions and how they're able to articulate their inner worlds, you know. Do you have a question now? The door just opened, okay. The door opened. It's a dramatic moment in the show. (laughs) She share what kinds of things was she, was she asking? Uh, I have a question. Did you hear that Emily's question? I did. So just for everybody's um, benefit, in case you don't, in case people don't understand what a multi-channel um, ex- um, ex- exhibition is, for example, right now we have a multi-channel Zoom um, experience. That means there are like twelve screens. So imagine that there are twelve monitors in in a museum or in a gallery. Uh, those would be considered a multi-channel uh, installation, okay? So um, a single channel is when you have to compress all of that experience into a single monitor. So it's hard in Narendra's experience to separate the elements, which would normally be distinct and separate elements, like the sound element could be coming from a speaker in the corner of the room. The video elements could be all happening independently. You know, the sound of 
the ocean could be coming out of the floor as a separate element. So we're talking about how to uh, kind of, in a sense, a compromise and how do you create um, the sensation you want to create as an artist in a single channel when you, you know, usually want to do this in a multi-channel vision. So these are challenges that many of us face in the technical um, execution or, or, you know, expression of, of a work that has complex uh, meanings and levels and complex number of materials that no, don't necessarily belong in the same spoon, you know. <laughs> um, so um, Emily was wondering, and when, when, let's go into some work um, soon, because you're obviously um, a uh, polymath of sorts. Uh, yeah, you work in different media, you're a film producer, you're a, um, exploring and pioneering, you know, this sort of contemporary you know, more or less uh, cutting edge art installation environment. <laughs> um, you bring a lot to the table as an international multiracial, multicultural person who lived in different countries and familiar with different languages. So your sensibility is quite distinct from, let's say, from someone from um, Bluegrass Mountains who does, you know, outsider art paintings or something like that. But the perspective of objectivity may be very similar, but your input and your sensibility is so much um, enriched by your, your various ex experiences, which don't seem to conflict within your personality. You don't seem a conflicted person. You seem to have integrated these experiences and you've produced a rather uh, contemplative, calm child in the person <laughs> of Maya. Um. So, um, I think my, my therapist might beg to differ, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that, well, um, but it's, sure, it's, sure. It's, it's your intelligence to seek therapy. You know, that's, that's a, a particular, uh, you know, capacity and um, in, insight, you know. Mm. But Emily wanted to understand a few of the questions that you asked these fellows, these men who you interviewed um, f with their full knowledge of what this was, that their voices would be experienced in the space where um, the filmed scrotums of other gentlemen were being um, exhibited or right. seen. They knew that. Yeah, people. Yeah, it was full disclosure. I wanted people to understand the context for. So for, what, I just wanted to know what what yes. kind of questions you asked these these people. What topics? I mean, just some very simple questions like, um, what does it mean to be a man? Um, when was the last time you cried? Um, questions about the relationships with their parents. And, you know, I had a basic set of questions, but obviously, you know, as you know, during an interview, you go where the interview takes you, you know, because if somebody opens a door, you can't just be like, oh, let's stick to these, you know, let's stick to these questions, because that might be something more profound than you get even anticipated. So those are just like the basic set of questions that I would ask, and then we would see where, where it would go. Um, and it went in a, a myriad of places. I think for, for it has a potential to be an exquisite, very um, empowering um, experience for people to actually allow us to, all to be vulnerable. Because right. it, it feels like in our vulnerability, we actually connect with each other more. We're actually That's the only way we can connect. With the world, right? Yeah. yeah. Without it's actually connect. the only way. Yeah. Without There's no other way. There's no other way. We, and you see that just with regard to uh, toxic masculinity, you know, uh, patriarchy is, is embedded in the fabric of our society. You know, like we don't, it's like asking a goldfish about water. They can't see it. And male, female, other, you know, we're all exposed to it. And you see that all of this suppression of emotion is leading to violence against women, violent, you know, suicide for, um, you know, the suicide rates for men are like through the roof. Um, you see like radicalization with, you know, whether it's neo-Nazi or hate, you know, or, or, or um, radical Islam, you know, like the people are, men especially, people in general, but men especially, because they haven't been able to have that voice, are seeking community. They're seeking 
belonging, they're seeking. And because we don't have the language, we're not talking about these things. We're not allowing them to let their guards down and be vulnerable. They're seeking these very, um, the only the only emotion that they're allowed to uh, express, which is rage and anger. You know, Narenda, um, during the COVID, um, we have pandemic, we have pandemonium, we have pathology, we have obsessive behavior, we have extremism, um, uh, almost like cultism, fetishism. Um, when society is shaken up in this way, people seem to gravitate toward these, you know, strange um, polar um, experiences. But they're not strange because okay. they have the tenets of family that those people are lacking. Do you know what I mean? It's the expression may not be quote unquote normal, but what they're seeking is what we seek within our families, within our friend groups, within our communities. You know, what they're seeking is very normal. It's just the expression is uh, dangerous. Yeah. That's, that's a very generous uh, point of view. So why don't we look into some work and um, there's your friend Gordon Skinner down there somewhere on the screen here. Hi, Gordon. I haven't seen Gordon in ages. How are you? Uh, unmute yourself, Gordon, and say hello while Emily gets set up here. It's so great to see you. Congratulations on all your work. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still still in the commercial game, as you all know, because um, <laughs> this art thing doesn't <laughs> doesn't pay the bills. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's good. It, it, and happy it's upcoming. Crying. Happy, huh? upcoming, happy upcoming birthday. Oh, yes. Thank you. Next week, the big four or five. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. did have a question, if you, if, you know, in the time that we have briefly. And that is... Um, He's always doing you, this. He's always doing <laughs> <laughs> You opened the floor. You told him to unmute. What do you want him to do? <laughs> <laughs> it's fluidity. Fluidity. Is, your work, is, is the current work, the multi-channel, in any way informed by Mike Vegas's time code at all? Is there no. a relationship between each one of the channels or are they just going to be independent or autonomous of one another, even though their proximity is adjoined to one another? I mean, the, the, three, the three main projections will be different scrotums as they, you know, as they cycle. It'll, yeah. They'll be on, on um, uh, looped. Um, because like the single channel, I have it as nine minutes, nine for 940, right? Mm -hmm. And people still sit there. I have people, the, the last showing, watch it for, watch it four times, you know? And I don't necessarily, you know, in a, a different gallery set, setting, I don't know that people would stand there for, you know, nine minutes, 36 minutes looking, staring at it. But once you know that there's these other components where you can kind of be a fly on the wall at these interviews. Um, I think, and each of each of those now with COVID, like the whole thing, you know, you go to a um, to a museum and you there's a there's a video piece and you put the headphones on. Right. Do people want to really touch the headphones that 15 million other people have touched? Probably not. Um, so I'm looking at an AR kind of option where people can look at it on their phones or listen to the interviews on their phones. But there's no relationship or no connective tissue between each one of those uh, standalone interviews. No, I mean each of each of those. It's been, the the thread that is through, throughout, whether it's the um, the macro images of the scrotum or it's the interviews. It's the vulnerability. You know, the you're looking at what happens on the most vulnerable part of a man. You're listening to these conversations based on like all of them have the the basic framework of those questions I mentioned before, right. um, but they obviously everybody's in their, their stories are different. So they go, they diverge, but ultimately that's the through thread. It's this vulnerability, this exposing oneself um, in a world that sees a, that exposure as weakness. That's amazing. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Thanks Gordon. Gordon, I don't think I recognize this image. Uh, I mean, could be any of us, I guess. 
Well, that's the thing. It's like there, there is a, it's intentional, the abstraction. You know, first of all, people think that this, you know, when you hear balls, oh, they're disgusting. They're like, you know, oh, I, you know, people just have, are rev revolved <laughs> by them, they're appalled. Um, but there is something beautiful about that. You know, we talk about, you know, the penis, the dick, everything, like it's all about the phallic symbol, but that is not where the true the measure of a man's virility, it's, it's in the, the scrotum. And that you see that the scrotum has such a beautiful kind of mesmerizing movement in, in order to protect itself, you know, it's kind of a great metaphor for what we're exploring. When I saw it, I thought, you know, it looked like some sea urchin in the deep, deep pool. <laughs> and I really, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe it was a kind of, um, reminded me of also, um, a raw um, plum, mm. you know, something like that, and umeboshi plum or something like that, you know. So yeah, I've gotten a lot of different, a lot of different, you know. This little girl came to the last exhibition. She said it looks like um, a knee or an elbow, and I said, yeah, and you know, there's plenty of places on our bodies that kind of look the same. I mean, obviously, her mother didn't tell her what she was looking at, but it's not a sexual thing. It's not, you know, pornography or anything. So, you know, she was able to look at it very objectively. I've also gotten um, brains, a sweater, which was bizarre. <laughs> um, but, you know, like there's a, there's a reason why I don't, I don't, I, I want people to not even know what they're looking at until they know what they're looking at. Um, yeah, okay. So Emily has a few, uh, links and images to share as well. Um, there's something really evocative about that image, obviously, and it, it has it has it's like a universal, you know, f form or something like that that has this primordial impact on your on your mind when you watch it. It's, it's very hypnotic. A bicycle. <laughs> Now we're going into the, do you consider this a documentary film? What is the the project, the nature of the project? Tell us about that. I can't see. Um, well, I'm, yeah, um, since August of last year, uh, I've been working on a documentary. Um, Can you guys see the image, by the way? It might, she may have to like click on them so she, that they can open up. Like click on all of them and I don't know. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Oh, maybe Double not. Double click. Can you see it now? No, it's still small. It's still just like in the folder. I mean, I can talk about it while she while she figures it out. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, so yeah, August of last year, um, I was approached by a friend, a makeup artist friend whose um, boyfriend had met this young man who decided, as a result of the protests that were going on uh, last summer, that he was going to. He was an avid cyclist, and he wanted to cycle um, a route inspired by the Underground Railroad and film it. Um, and she, so her, so my friend reached out, I met with John, there we go. Um, I met with John, uh, Lynn, uh, my producing partner on the project. And, um, we just went straight to it. You know, usually you need a year of planning <laughs> and fundraising to, uh, do a documentary, but we had a matter of like three weeks, um, probably three or four weeks to, to get on the road because he was doing it whether or not we were filming it. He was going to either have his friend film it or whatever. And we just thought this was like such a compelling story, you know, black, um, there were four black men and a, uh, a Latinx guy um, riding, you know, cycling, one in a predominantly white sport that they're avid, you know, um, uh, not followers, but they're avid cyclists themselves. Um, so to be able to show black and brown people in a way that is um, not the stereotypical, but what's real and, 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 and normal for them was exciting. Being able to go um, 
and explore these sites that were like really important to the, Af uh, the, the, the struggle for, for freedom for black people in America was super exciting. Um, just to be able to, to make this come to, together, you know, I jumped in and um, luckily we we're able to make it happen. We shot uh, over the course of 18 days. Well, we shot longer because we had some back, back, um, uh, backstory interviews, but we were on the road for 18 days through the deep South um, during COVID and had leading up to the, the elections. Um, so it was an interesting, a very interesting time on the road. Let's put it that way. Ah, oh, you're on mute, I think. John. Miranda, what, what is the correlation for you between the you know, the film and your more, you know, personal work as, a, as an artist. Um, I mean, it also speaks to identity as well. Thematic, thematically, you know, thematically it's also. It's about identity, you know, like, although, you know, I'm biracial, I'm, I just got my, you know, ancestry. So I'm 51% Middle Eastern and 49% African, West African, uh, Malian specifically, um, and Nigerian and Benin on, the, on a smaller scale. Um, so I'm biracial, but I identify as black, you know, I look black, I feel black, I, and it's also not even just the feeling, it's a, it's political as well, you know, being black has been something to be ashamed of, of. being black is something to be maligned, something to be um, looked down upon, and I, I claim it fully for myself. So these guys were trying to find identity through this route, which I explore like this history and through history, you find identity, you know, like the history of black people in America is definitely very whitewashed and very, um, uh, it's not told the way that it actually happened. So this was an opportunity, not only for um, these young men to explore that, but for the, for the audience to explore it as well. I mean, there are things that I learned as a result of this film that I had no idea. And I think I'm, I'm pretty well read. Um, so yeah, it's, it all always boils down to identity, whether it's gender, your religion, your race, it's all about trying to find who you are. It's we're constantly coming of age in a way. Just a question. I mean, it, it may seem very, you know, academic question, but um, Narendra, did you feel prejudiced living in Switzerland? I'm sure I did, <laughs> but um, yeah, not particularly. I mean, I, I was really young when I was going to school there. And then when I was um, stuck there after the start of the Liberian Civil War in 1990, I don't recall much in terms of... Mm, any racist um, interactions per se. But um, when you came to the States, you felt- Oh, racist. immediately. Like as soon as we moved to Park Ridge, like my grandmother, who's like a brown skinned woman, hijab, she's made Hajj to Mecca. So she has, you know, her whole situation, you know, that is different and scary. You know, not only are we black, but now we've got this other element to it. They let us know right away that we were not welcome there. Like I said, we were taking a walk around our neighborhood, something that we did in, in, in Tone, the suburb of Geneva uh, all the time. And um, these boys were up the hill um, and started throw, pelting rocks at um, my grandmother and I. And, um, and I didn't know what the word meant, but I knew it wasn't good. And I sure as hell wasn't gonna let them hurt my grandmother. So I started throwing the rocks back, but it was like, Moving to that town, I realized immediately um, the dynamics of race in this country. I just wanted to share with you that when I was stoned as an Italian kid in a mostly German Irish neighborhood, uh, you know, there was blood running down my back from my head, and they had screamed at me, you know, Guinea Wop. These were guys that I was playing with almost every day. And all of a sudden this happened. And I realized that everything had been tainted by this cultural discrimination. Everything was tainted by it, as, as in all things. 
you know? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a hierarchy, you know, in terms of the, there was more so um, in the early 1900s and, and it still kind of peaks in here and there. And like, we're seeing what, what's happening with the, the rise in violence against Asian people. Like for the longest time, Asian people are the model minority and they get to ex occupy these Ivy League schools and these jobs and they're, you know, present and they're hardworking and they're, you know, da da da. But the moment something happens, you're dropped. You're no longer held on this pedestal anymore. As soon as there's something that, 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 um, threatens the hierarchy you're you're dropped like italians would were were depicted as like almost like uh, gorillas in the um, cartoons in the 1900s you know like that those attitudes and and the irish before them you know so it's funny that they would then do that to you but it's always you know what 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 america does is it's always hedging one group against another because divide and conquer works and we've been so indoctrinated into it that we buy into it every single time, you know, without even thinking. Um, well, I don't think it's just America, Narenda. Well, I mean, well, we, we speak yeah. of here, but it's, yeah. but it's definitely global. Anti-Blackness especially, because no matter where you go in this world, being Black is the worst thing you can possibly be. So it's then you go, then you go on the, on the hierarchy above and then you start, people then jockey for, for whatever okay, so, position. So now you're this kid and you're throwing stones back, right? <laughs> very the, very poorly. The they're, they're like middle school kids, boys, and I'm like a first grader throwing stones. Like, yeah, sure. I wasn't doing a great job. But now, you know, um, you're a filmmaker, you're an artist, and um, you're throwing a different kind of stone back into the water, back into, you know, these ripple effects that you're creating with your own stones. Hmm. <laughs> it's nice. Literally stones in the ripple effect. <laughs> but no, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's actually, I never thought about that. Um, I never thought about it that way. But yeah, I mean, that's my intention. I mean, what, 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 what else are you making work for, but it, for it to either inspire something, a different thought, or to impact someone in a way that is unlike how they were seeing things before. Okay, let's just take a look at the video. And, and Narenda, I have a couple yeah. more questions. What? It's a teaser. It's a teaser. Emily said this. Yeah, is this is the teaser prior to us shooting. So this is what we use for fundraising, for crowdfunding, for um, getting uh, uh, some, some support from brands. Um, mostly in the cycling world. So okay. and, yeah, and this is, is what we use. Audio, audio element, narrative yeah. storytelling. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, there's, a, there's audio to it. Go ahead. I'm going to mute myself so we don't get a, a feedback. So just tell us again what we're seeing, okay, Narenda? So this, right, right here, you see John Shackelford, uh, John Bobby Shackelford, he goes by Bobby, um, as we shoot him riding around New York and talking about why he wants to do, to do this ride. I'll have a hundred miles. There we go. Can you hear it? Yeah, now we can. You might want to restart it. Okay. In September, like 15. How far have you ever ridden a bike? Go to the dirt track. Where's that at? That's like all the way down there. Uh, what's that, like High Bridge? Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice trek. So I'm riding 1,100 miles. Yeah. I know. In September, like 15 days. You think you can do that? See you think you can do it? There it is. Honestly, I'd be just by another kid in the hood. Cycling saved my life. Cycling has given me my first responsibilities, my first real job, first time I've ever been on a plane in my life was because of a bike. I knew that I stood out and I liked it. I love it, it fueled me. Like it, that shit made me like so hyped. Like, oh, I'm the only brother out here? Cool, we gonna show you how it's done, you know, like show you how we rip it. African Americans are being targeted. 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 Targeting men for biking while black. Where black people have come from, freedom from slavery, to where black people are today. Is there a difference? Are we free? I 
want to bike the Underground Railroad. No one on the Underground Railroad did it by themselves. And now is not the time to go solo, because if you work better as a team, anything can happen to me, man. I can get killed. It can happen. I don't want people to think that it can't. And to be on a mode of transportation that I am, on the side of the highway, and God knows where, that's not safe in general. And to be black while doing it, it's I just want to inspire the youth, kids who live in inner city areas, who've never been on a bike, who've never left their communities. I want them to experience the freedom of cycling. So let's go. Let's bike the Underground Railroad. You want to hear our voices, you want to speak our mind because our presence is known. Thank you for the great work you're doing. Uh, no, no small, no small job, and um, reminds me a little bit of this um, Buddhist, uh, Zen Buddhist American guy, a Jewish guy, Bernie Glassman, who took people to Auschwitz and led these retreats that he called witnessing. We are witnessing history just by being in that place where these atrocities occurred or he took people into uh, neighborhoods where there were homeless people and those people that he brought were homeless for about two weeks or three weeks with no money no food whatsoever so it has this power to really nurture uh, identification also for the viewer, because we feel that we're traveling with these people and it's a discovery process and it's almost like problem solving and discovery and adventure. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really marvelous. It's just incredible, actually. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I see in your work that you have this tendency and proclivity to want to make art. Do you think that art gets the job done better somehow? It's a better stone to throw? I don't know that I ever thought about it like that. Um, I mean, is it creating something that's compelling that, that evokes emotion? Um, if that's art, then yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's always what I've wanted to do. Um, where, you know, God willing, the work is is seen and 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 touches someone in a way that um, makes them rethink something in their lives or in the larger world. But your your work as a TV producer, director. Eh. Well, I do. I, I my background, like my bread and butter, what what I was able to raise Maya on was uh, my commercial. Like I produce commercials, you know, um, and as a, an anti-capitalist, it does really, <laughs> it doesn't really jive with my politics because um, I'm just shilling more shit for people to buy, excuse my French, um, things that people don't need, things that people think that will, will imbue their identity with meaning or value or whatever. Um, so like when I was 11 and I was like, I want to be a filmmaker, it was definitely not to, to to sell stuff. <laughs> hey, that again. What happened to Will Smith? <laughs> huh? Oh, there's Will Smith. Yeah, that was for uh, Montclair. Um, a shoot we did for Montclair. He was, he was a very, he was a consummate professional, I gotta say. He got in there, he did what he needed to do because we had a tight day and he was in and out. Yeah. So this is all to, you know, sell them. They're very expensive jackets, you know. Um, that's 
Taraji P. Henson to sell some lipstick. But her, I think this was her, um, her lipstick that was gonna go towards like uh, AIDS research. So what, what was your role in, in these productions, Narenda? What did you do? Uh, oh, uh, producing. Um, yeah, producing. Basically firefighting, handholding. Hand, so somebody you know. else is directing, somebody else is editing. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like okay, so it's with, a, with with commercials, like yeah, every you know, there's so much happening. The client is so demanding. You need to have the best technicians uh, on your team to make sure that it, uh, it it's up to snuff. You know that it has production values that you that are required to to sell things to people. So as as a as a cultural producer. Uh, and and um, perhaps activist. Mm. Do you see this? Your work would be more fulfilling if you moved into a more of a so-called art mode rather than um, commercial uh, mode. Do you, would you be more feel more um, you know rewarding and, and and fulfilled by doing that work as as an, uh, more like installation? Or is that where you're moving? Is that where you want to go? At this moment, I mean, the you know the art practice definitely um, is. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> My neighbors are having. I don't know what's going on. Um, but like the art practice definitely allows a space where to play in a way. Even though you know, as you know, one of my projects is not playful at all. Um, but it, it just, it, you're not limited to, to the medium. You're not limited to the subject matter. You're not limited to, um, to how you want to present it, you know? So yeah, like that, you know, just prepping for, for the last show for the ripple effect was in, I spent a week like schwitzing on like how to recut this thing. It was super stressful. But it was like the best week I'd had in a long time because it was purely of my own volition. It was purely my own agency that was pushing through, um, getting it ready to be seen, you know? Uh, and it was, I loved it. It was exhilarating. Um, so like that is definitely, uh, there's, a, there's a freedom that it, 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 it gives me that I don't normally have because I work a very within very tight parameters with, with work. And that being said, I still have other projects that I wanna do in the film and TV space, you know? Um, I'm working on a, uh, a series, I've written a pilot for a series uh, set in 14th century, you know, West Africa, you know? Like there's, that's, that's gonna be very expensive to make and I'm gonna have to work with people that you know, who are very capitalist in their approach to television. Like nobody's gonna buy this thing and spend all this money if they can't get a return. So it's a very different, if it, it's, it's, it's still within that like realm of commercial, it's commercial, you know? However, it's a story that I think needs to be told um, so that people have, can place, you know, place history where it actually needs to be not in this like um, suppressed and like um, way of, of being told like we're taught in school, you know? Um, this is something that is entertaining but is actually based in facts. And um, you know, you get your, it's like a spoonful of medicine to, or a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. You're watching something that's really entertaining and walking away with, you know, a new perspective you know, like what happened with Watchmen. I don't know if you're familiar with that show, Watchmen. Their first episode, like the first scene was the Tulsa massacre um, in 1921, I believe. And the rise of like Google searches to see if that would actually happen in history was like, it was through the roof. Um, and, and that's what I want people to do. I want people to watch this show and then Google, like, did that really happen? Who are these people? Matsumusa, who's that? You know, like I want people to, 
not be told their, the history, but to want to seek it out for themselves. Because that's one thing that's missing in our society. The critical thinking, the curiosity, the questioning is very, um, it's, it's lacking. And if I can provide this Trojan horse of entertainment, that can also be educational and, and uh, impactful and inspirational or what have you, then I'll do it. So yeah, there's like the not making money on, on the art and then there's like this multi-million dollar per episode um, show that I wanna do. So. When do you think it was that you first had the impulse or the, the cognition that you had something to contribute as a cultural producer or as a statement of some kind about the world and society and the, these places that you occupied, perhaps, uh, you know, across different parts of the globe. What was that? <laughs> I don't think that's happened. <laughs> I think that I've never thought about it in those terms. You know, all I know is when I was like in fifth grade, we were told to make up, uh, we could make our own plays and put them on. And the satisfaction I got from like, you know, dictating the script to my aunt and then directing my friends and creating a world and a story um, was, I loved it. You know, that was the moment I was like, this is what I wanna do. I wanna tell stories. I wanna create something out of nothing. But I had to, to think of myself in like a, in terms of like a global culture producer. Like, I don't think, like, I, I definitely don't. I deal with a lot of imposter syndrome, I gotta tell you. Um, because you know, as a producer, I could do that in my sleep. But as a creative person, putting my create, creative uh, endeavors out for public consumption, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not feeling that confident. Even though when I talk to people and they feel something from it, yeah, that boosts my confidence. But to to call myself, even to call myself an artist, is something that I've just started to think about and and, and do. Um, in the past year, and it's because of the pandemic, you know, like life is tenuous. I, like I'm turning 40, I'm like having an existential like reckoning where it's like my time is, is limited and I have to put the things that, you know, the purpose that I was given in, in, in by, by virtue of my birth, I have to put them into the world before it's too late. One of the other producers here has um, <laughs> made a note about my visual appearance. Uh, I beg your pardon for your sensitivity, violating your sensitivities. What happened? <laughs> I, I, I've, been, I, I've been observed being out of focus at times during this broadcast. And I have to admit, feeling literally that, and figuratively. That sounds <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> You can't do this alone. You got to, you know, it's a team, it's teamwork. It's a team. It's all collaborative. It's all collaborative. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I guess, Narenda, what's interesting is that you have explored, as example, with the ripple effect. Um, you've explored the vulnerability of masculinity and male identification, et cetera. But you've also seemed to step into your own um, comfort zone being vulnerable yourself um, as an artist uh, working in a new um, medium, a new set of rules, a new rules that you make up yourself, um, stories that you want to, you know, share or abstraction that you want to reveal. Um, so how is it that you are nurturing, you know, your own creativity? Um, you mentioned therapy, you talk about meditation. So how is it that you're sort of, um, you know, giving more agency to the unknown, to your vulnerability and how are you doing with that? What do you, what do you, what, what's up? Uh, vulnerability is very tricky. And I think I only got there through therapy like a few years ago. I think to a certain degree, doing the ripple effect was an exercise in seeing how I can be vulnerable by making others vulnerable or allow, allowing others to be vulnerable. It was kind of like from a, an opportunity for me to kind of see how that works. Cause I, I um, was 
the experiences I've had, the, 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 I've, I've definitely not been ever allowed myself to be very vulnerable. I used to be very closed off. Um, and yeah, so it was, I think that I was exercising that, that muscle. And then as a result of therapy, I got very vulnerable and very like, you know, like, uh, allowed myself to, to feel, um, like my, my therapist, um, if famously, I would tell him, you'd be like, you have to feel Naren. And I'd be like, fuck your feelings. Like I didn't, I wasn't interested in um, going there because I didn't know if I would be able to come back. You know, like I said, I wasn't raised by my parents. So I had a lot of abandonment issues um, amongst other things. And um, so it took a long time for me to, to break that shell. Even after doing that project, even knowing full well you know, this is something that needs to be done. That's how we connect with others. I like, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't make, I couldn't connect the dots for myself. Um, but now, yeah, like I said, you know, like um, being faced with my mortality, being faced with just this world and, and, and how dangerous and, and, and really sad it's becoming, you know? Um, I have to do my part. Like I, I, I could sit there, like I've, I've had conversations with friends, political conversations, just like all the things that are wrong with the world, right? And it's like, I can't keep having those conversations because I keep having them and it keeps leaving me depressed and frustrated and angry. And what, what then? So I've basically just recommitted myself to doing my part. Like we can only do, like the, back to the ripple effect, I, not intentionally, but we can only affect our sphere of influence and hopefully that we can then influence one person who can then ripple that, that ripples out to somebody else. So I've really, as much as I've had imposter syndrome, I really want, my mission is to really get these, these projects out and see if I can, um, I can inspire one person or, uh, it, it, you know, cause a different difference in perspective or, ignite a conversation that wouldn't normally be had. Oh, Nancy, do you want to um, say something at this point? Nancy Azara? She has to un unmute herself. Um, by the way, I don't know if Nancy's going to say anything about this, but are, are you aware, Narenda, of a number of women artists who have exposed and used their naked physical bodies, their vulvas, their breasts, obviously. Huh? Oh, there you are, Nancy. Please st step in. Nancy, hi. Hi. Uh, uh, hello, Narendra. Hello. Hi, Nancy. Group. Hi. Um, well, mostly I'm listening. It's uh, a way of looking at things since I come out of um, a more a tactile place, a more... Um, a sculpture and a wood carver. And um, I worked a lot in clay years ago um, as a student. And I did work in the theater for a while. So I do have some background in production and organization and those kinds of skills, uh, which always um, I have great respect for because there's uh, so many things going on when you work in the theater. The only thing I didn't like about it was the franticness and the craziness that people <laughs> sort of manufactured by and large, because it was not necessarily essential to the working of the situation. It was yes. just something that made people high. But that was a long time ago, but I can't imagine it's changed too much since then. No, it's still um, happening. Yeah, I bet. I mean, that's just where everybody functioned. So it wasn't right for me, and I really wanted to be involved in a more meditative place. Um, so I've been just listening. I don't have too many questions. I might have them in the future. And I do know Emily. So I can always um, kind of put a question to you, perhaps. But it's just a lot of things to think about. And I think you're very courageous to ask men uh, to photograph, have themselves photographed this way. Uh, after all, women have been photographed in so many compromising manners for right. such a long time without any, um, except for the morality 
of group of certain groups um, has has not been questioned. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is something that's requiring men to rethink um, how, of how they took themselves for granted or take themselves for granted. Um, and that's across the line. If you're a man, you really do have this self uh, understanding and appreciation of yourself. Of course, there are artists, male artists who have tried to uh, change their gender and also work with that concept of changing their gender uh, in their paintings. Their names escape me at the moment, but they do exist. And I've seen videos and films about several. So that's really all. I don't have a lot to say, but I'm, I'm finding it very interesting discussion. So thank you for having it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I have actually explored the tactile though, Nancy. I do have an installation that's braids and other objects. So I've, I've, uh -huh. I've gotten great satisfaction from it. I mean, my, my carpal tunnel is on fire, but you know, so I have, I have a, a lot of respect for people who work in those mediums. So yeah, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to show it to you one day. Well, that would be lovely. It's, it's um, I imagine you would have that because the quality of your video and filming does have that connection. So there was um, a kind of a, a, a kind of a mutual understanding at that very primitive level about tactile and about um, the presentation of a visual manifestation. So those are pretty uh, pretty wide, uh, long words, but that's what I think that gets through into the primitive part of it. So good, thank you. Thanks. That's that's really beautiful, Nancy. Very, oh, thank very, you. Something there, Narenda. Nancy's taught um, many many workshops in um, discovery. Right, and unconscious. Yeah. Can you just tell Narenda a little bit about that, Nancy, and the rest of our audience? And Nancy was on our show a few weeks ago too, as as was Gordon. And sooner or later, Babette is going to be on the show. Babette's here from Holland, Amsterdam. It's a little bit later really? over there. Um, nice lighting, Babette, over there on the sofa. <laughs> oh, God. So, um, well, I, <clears throat> I developed workshops in Art in the Unconscious so that people went into, and um, women started, um, sometimes I have men who come, uh, but most of the time it's women because it was developed as a tool to help women to get more understanding of their inner self and um, to sort out these different things that they don't feel entitled to and maybe aspire to or maybe not, maybe are even unaware that they exist. So that's how those workshops developed. And I'm doing one, well, with uh, COVID, I don't know, but I am doing one now in, at the end of July. And that will be uh, upstate New York and it'll be a full day workshop. And we're going to look at what the future, how we would like to map out our future. Um, I was thinking when I was designing it that we're sort of toward the end of COVID. And after watching TV last night, I wasn't so sure anymore. But I, I imagine, I mean, I think we have to just be hopeful. So anyway, so that's what I'm doing. And people make art out of a meditative state. I take them on a journey into their unconscious and they make art out of that. And then we talk about the art that comes out of it. We discuss it and examine it and see how it personally relates not only to them, but other participants have, a t have an opportunity to see how it personally relates to themselves as well. So that's what I do. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Narendra, Thank I was you. very touched when you said something about um, like how looking back in retrospect at the ripple effect, the meanings and perhaps maybe the function that it had in your own, you know, inner uh, um, dialogue with yourself, your, you know, your inner confrontation or conflicts or whatever. But um, 
it reminded me when um, Martin Scorsese said to me, I don't know why I made the film. I, I never know why I make these things until much later. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very archetypal um, state and you have to really admire the courage that we have to work with a certain degree of unknown, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like the impetus comes and you have to, <laughs> you have to do it. Um, yeah. There's a lot of unknowns, but it, there's also like that feeling where, you know, if you don't, like if you don't tap into that, you'll die, you know, and it, it was not physical death, but it's a psychic death, you know, like you're, Say that yeah, again. There's an, if you don't what? Say it again. I said like there's for me like and I, I you know I'll speak for myself. Like there's this feeling where like if I don't do the thing that it's trying to come out like like I'll die. But not like obviously not not in like the hyperbolic I'm gonna die you know like but in that psychically like every time you don't allow yourself to do that thing you die a little bit, you know, it's like death by a thousand paper cuts um, and that numbness that comes with it. So yeah, like. I think you're talking about this choiceless attitude of jumping off a ledge. Well, it's a leap and the, and the net shall appear, right? Um, but I think there, even with that, there's agency that comes with it, you know? There's a great sense of like, purpose that comes with it that I think we're lacking generally in, in, in our world. Like people don't really feel like they can actually move the needle at all because it's also feels so insurmountable. But when you have these smaller things that you can tap into, whether or not they're like bursting, trying to burst forth or, or they're just noodling around your brain, knocking about, you know, like bringing it, it gives you, your purpose is revealed in those things. And you can feel, you get a sense of who you really are outside of all the noise. Emily and I are trying to engender that sense of um, community and collaboration and camaraderie um, for anyone who wants to work together um, and connect through the space of our institute and to draw from the Institute, you know, inspiration and, uh, and um, you know, fearlessness. Um, and, you know, we hope, of course, Nancy will be listing your workshop and we have other workshops that we list, resources for cultural activists and so mm -hmm. forth. So um, it's a big, really great honor, you know, that we're talking about these matters Thanks to you, Narenda, mm -hmm. and the space you're holding for us, this this vibration, this tuning in. Mm -hmm. Looks like Ron Smith is percolating something. <laughs> I appreciate you guys having me on. It's um, I I just I, I think I told you I was not uh, I wasn't. Now, I wasn't not looking forward to it, but I wasn't looking forward to it. Um, but it's definitely been really good. Um, and I mm -hmm. really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you for your vulnerability and your courage and inspiration. I think Ron really does have something to... I do, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I really, really appreciate this distinction you make between your commercial work and your artwork. And... Uh, with so many younger artists that I talk to, they don't have a clear idea about why they're doing what they're doing. So this shows up very clearly in the way you discuss your work. The, the question, if there is a question here, is it seems that you bring a great deal of integrity to both the commercial work and the artistic work. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could speak to the similarities between that work rather than the differences. Mm. Um, 
Well, you know, the psychology that's in, that is used in commercials, for, let's say, right? Um, they hit you in those certain points to make you feel um, that you need this thing, right? Um, and I, not that I'm putting, not that I'm putting that kind of energy into the work, but I think there has to be some kind of compelling quality. It has to present, be presented in a way okay. that's beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, or interesting at the very least. Um, so that people kind of perk up. Cause there's, like I said, there's so much noise. There's so much to sift through. We have this tsunami of information and things begging for our attention. Um, so if you're going to make something, not that, um, <laughs> um, not that it needs to hit those particular notes but it has to do something. It has to feel, you have to feel something, you know, like watching a film, you know, you walk out of that film and you feel like you've, um, you've gone through that experience or, you know, that you feel changed in some way. And that, I think that's, that's the, maybe the thing. Uh, and one, one more point then, and then I'll mute myself. Uh, <laughs> there's a huge leap of faith that you appear to take in the artwork. And I'm wondering, is there anything comparable to that in the commercial work? Do you ever take a leap of faith with the people you hire, with the focus of the commercial, with... Um, the editor with the design, is there, is there any gap in there or not? Uh, as Gordon knows, there's not much room for uh, okay. a lot okay. of things. However, you know, in terms of hiring, you know, in terms of hiring, um, there is some leeway. A lot, of, a lot of clients will say they wanna do this really exciting new thing and then they see it and they're like, nope. <laughs> No, thank you. Um, yes. So you're back to what the creatives are coming up with in the room and how you have to like translate that idea into what the final package will be or the final um, product, but in the people around you. You know, I believe like, even though the work that I've been doing has been mostly by myself, it's not by myself because I'm talking to people, even with the, um, the, the, the another project that I have, it's called um, Black Girls Dream. And it's all about, you know, it's all these braids and whatnot. I still have like my, my friends come and, and we braid. Um, so there is a collaration that happens. So that's in, in, in that's the one space you can okay. kind of like bring the right people in because it's also the energy of the, the mm -hmm. day, you know, mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. like, like Nancy alluded to, it's a very stress stressful and it's very convoluted stress. Like who cares if like the director didn't get his salmon lunch or whatever, you know, or the <laughs> shoe isn't exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, so with all of that stress, when you have these people that you know and they can do really great work and show up in the way that I don't have to worry about later, that's where, you know, it comes together and it's, um, yeah. and it's, and, that's where my heart is. Like on yeah. a shoot day, I'm so excited. We're like, even with, even, and even with COVID, even with our <laughs> protocols, like I, bet I haven't seen people in a long time. I have to like, at least a little hug, you know, a very, like a, a three foot face hug, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Gordon, <laughs> you're, Gordon, you're, you're, yeah, you go. Where's Gordon? Gordon's there. Okay, good. Gordon asked his question already. He jumped the gun. He did. <laughs> that was filler. He got a loaded gun. That was, was filler. I was. Actually, oh, you were just tap dancing for us. <laughs> I was filling the space for him. I, but I do have a question for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it comes out of you know not only the sustainability of the the discourses and the projects that we make, the endeavors that we take on, or not necessarily just multi-channeled, but how we're trying to have an affect uh, in whatever endeavors that we're doing and we're using these different tools vis-a-vis -vis, uh, film, theater, 
you know, education, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm working with uh, two particular uh, groups of men of color. One is addressing of a more spiritual place uh, and really going into very deep and uh, challenging conversations with them, with, when I say themselves, I mean are myself and then in relationship with others. However, the other group, which is called the Christmas Addicts League, and we're really looking at uh, how to change the narrative of the role of, of men of color, specifically black men in their communities in relationship to uh, women and, uh, and youth. And I'm wondering, you know, how have you seen, aside from a psychotherapeutic lens, how do you, how can you be vulnerable as a woman and still be open and accessible uh, and not so guarded, I'm wondering. And the other question is, how, do you, how can you also be vulnerable or be open with, in relationship to men and at the same time not be, uh, you know, exposing yourself in a way that could be, com that could compromise. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I'll answer that second one first. Um, it's also, it's just like I was talking about like crewing up. I'm very selective about the people around me. Right, right. You know, um, obviously you want to be open to people because there is that, um, you need to have dialogue with people that are not just like you, you know, preaching to the choir is, is like silly. Um, but you have to create this community, right? You have to have this place where, um, where you can, ju the jumping off point. So I think like making sure that the people around you share your values, share the community, you know, share, share the desire for a community. Um, that eliminates 90% of the guardedness, you know, right there, because they're meeting you where you are. You're meeting each other at where you are. And then you can, you're creating space for each other to like, elevate you know or vibrate higher um so like yeah i mean we're we in a world right, right now where the violence against women i mean it's always been like that you know we we're just talking to my friends the other night uh, uh about that where it's i remember having to carry my keys in my hands like a certain way so that if i was attacked that i would be able to at least have some kind of impact if somebody tried to overpower me i don't the fact that I have to tell my daughter she has to not dress like that or make sure she has mace or whatever. And she she said the same thing to, to me that I'd said to my parents or well, uh, maybe I didn't say to my parents because there was no talking back. Um, but in terms of like, she's like, I wanna, why should my, why should the onus be on me? Because somebody else can't control themselves, you know? And that's a as true when I was young, when she was, in high school or middle school to now, you know, like why is the onus on the woman to not get attacked, not get raped, not get murdered, you know what I mean? Um, so it's very difficult to be vulnerable just in the world that doesn't value vulnerability. It doesn't, it looks at anything that's not hard and, and, and rough and, violent as weakness you know is that globally or is that more or is it more pronounced in the u.s versus i mean that's definitely in the western world and it has affected and permeated cultures all over like a lot of indigenous cultures through colonialism or whatever have taken on these ideals and cultural things that were not necessarily indigenous to their cultures previously mm -hmm. um so if they can't even remember what their cultures were previous to, to Western, um, to Western thought. But even indigenous European cultures, you know, like before imperialism, just even of like, let's say like great, you know, Great Britain, the Irish, the Welsh, you know, the Scots, they had their own tribes and their own customs, their own religions and languages, you know, and they were eradicated, you know? So think about like the larger world, it's all, it's been, you know, it's always been, 
for a capital gain and a capital gain can't worry about your your feelings or worry about like and I got like and I took it on I was like I'm not feeling anything I have to I have to survive I have to raise my daughter I have to you know like we get caught in it you know as much as I know as much as I've been exposed to you're you're we're all susceptible to these these notions so um vulnerability is very tough to do in a culture like that but if you start with at least that that collective that is like-minded, you can grow from it. I've had to cut friends because they weren't what I needed and it, for, in order to go to the, to, to, to get to the next, elevate myself to where I need to be, where I can be vulnerable, where I can be joyful, where I can, you know, be in the moment. So yeah, that's, I don't know. I probably went off on a tangent, but. No, no, no thank you. And I, I mean, I'll follow up with you in an email because I've created it an anti-gender bias curriculum that we're implementing in high schools. Uh, and one specific school we're getting ready to deal with is an all, all boys school, uh, mm. a private elite all boys school. And so the conversation around the fact that why should a woman have to be the one who has to be so guarded? So, you know, as a, and, and that's not to, you know, come across as saying, well, then men have to protect women, but there is something in, you know, and I it isn't protecting women. It's also stepping in when a, another boy is doing something that is wrong. You know, exactly. what happens is they get teased if they do something that that's, doesn't go with the flow of what it takes to be a real man. There's good man and there's a real man. And they're constantly being swayed to be real men, which is some made up nonsense that serves no one, you know? I also, with regard to that, I love that they're, they're in school, they're in high school that you're doing this. Because one thing I've noticed, I remember go, growing up, I had tons of guy friends. I don't see that happening anymore, you know? And we're in like these factions, you know? How do you know? I remember giving my guy friends, a, you know, relationship advice, how to approach a girl, you know? Now they're only talking amongst themselves and they're all idiots, you know? like. How are you supposed to know how to talk to one another if you don't talk to one another, especially mm -hmm. at that age, you know? The segregation mm -hmm. just isn't racial, although in New oh, York, no. it is the most segregated school system in the country, but it is also by gender and class lines as well. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So, but, 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 I don't know if you're, if you're um, you know, able to participate or not, but we're both around the same, you know, we're in the same generation and we lived in the seventies where there was sort of blossoming of um, the feminist movement, you know, from the sixties and to some degree, mm -hmm. did we experience uh, um, an environment, a social environment, Babette, when you and I met, for example, uh, in the seventies in Europe, where there was more sort of um, spacious uh, respect and acknowledgement of uh, the the forces of the genders that it wasn't um, one dominating the other um, was it less? Do you remember? Was it was it less um, as it is now? It seems to be a little bit more conservative in certain ways, and also um, tribal in a certain way, as, as we are discovering chauvinistic uh, in a certain way. Not to make a pun about chauvin, who's uh, in court right now. Um, but you know, Ron has to go. Lots of love, Ron. Um, anyway, just curious, Babette, because we were there. Um, you... I'm so sorry. I have to excuse myself. I'm just not uh, feeling well physically. Okay. And I'm dealing with some health issues and have to be operated tomorrow. So I'm no. happy to uh, listen to you all. But uh, please excuse me. I'm I'm not um, capable of really participating. We we give you our love and support for tomorrow, Babette. Thanks for coming yes. coming in. Yeah, and I hope it's okay. been uh, thank you worthwhile to you know be part of this tonight. Yeah, yeah. thank you. A little vitamin. Miranda, mm -hmm. I think we've come up to our our. Uh, the hourglass is <laughs> empty. The top part of it is empty. The hourglass. So I mean, like the ripple effect. We had to, I don't know. <laughs> Turn it on its head. Thanks a lot. It's um, much bigger than a domino effect. The ripple effect. 
-hmm. It's an interesting idea. And you've, you know, you've given us so much. So thanks everybody. And um, Thank you. here's to uh, the 23rd show and um, everybody getting better, hopefully soon and getting over some of these bizarre behaviors. Um, thank you. See you tomorrow, Sally. Thank you, Randall. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. thank you. Talk to you tomorrow. The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International.